1973, Leo Fagan, a lecturer in linguistics from Leningrad in the Soviet Union, emigrated to the West. Like many before him, he had found the political and social restrictions of a totalitarian state intolerable. A year later, he had a job at an institution that would create enemies, but many more friends within the USSR. He started broadcasting jazz and Russian avant-garde music regularly to the culturally deprived audiences stretching from the Baltic states to the far reaches of Mongolia. Later in 1980, Leo founded a record label producing in the West clandestine recordings from the Soviet underground. What has emerged since then, and has only now realized since the dawn of Glasnost, is the growth of a hitherto unrecognized musical form which has come to be called Russian New Music. I was born in Leningrad in 1938, and as many youngsters of my generation we were literally glued to the radios listening to the voice of america and other western stations and what attracted us to this music was the mere fact that you couldn't hear this kind of stuff on the soviet radio it was impossible and this music was signifying for us uh, someone else's freedom Avant-garde music came to the Soviet Union, I would say, with the delay of about maybe 10, 15 years. So after it happened in the West. New music plays a very special part uh, for the people in the Soviet Union. Uh, I would say much greater part than mainstream jazz. And I saw myself as a broadcaster exactly from this point of view. I refused to entertain. And I thought that my uh, aim, my main objective was to give people in the Soviet Union the idea of what is happening on the music scene now. And you see, if I had unlimited time on the air, of course I would broadcast mainstream and all sorts of that. But because the time was limited and was very precious, I, of course, opted for avant-garde because avant-garde had always had special meaning for the Soviet people. This is the music of the future. And what is avant-garde uh, today is the mainstream of tomorrow. If I was invited back, probably I would go. But I must be invited. And I must be sure that they would give me a visa. <laughs> Fagan was finally granted a visa to visit Moscow. And for the first time in a 10-year collaboration, Leo was able to meet Alex Kahn, who had over the years provided a constant supply of clandestine recordings from the Russian underground. Although men in dark glasses still watch the foreign embassies, Leo and Alex are able to walk by the Moscow River and talk freely without fear of arrest or harassment. Of course it is ironic to stay, to be here and talk about avant-garde jazz. But then life is ironic and then everything that concerns Soviet Union is ironic. And of course 17 years ago when I was leaving this country, I had a feeling I was leaving forever and I had no idea I would ever come back. If you think about improvised music, you will realize that in a totalitarian society, improvised music is the only art form which cannot be censored by the very nature of it. It was very dangerous to produce these records. Uh, dangerous not for me, because I was the safest person to do it. I was in London. 
I was out of reach of the Soviet authorities, but it was very dangerous for the musicians to see their records released in the West. Now we can say that nobody suffered, nobody was punished, and we came a full circle. The musicians are getting more and more recognition, they travel abroad, and now, 17 years later, I'm standing here with this Kremlin wall behind me, and we have a body of Russian new music. A lot of records documenting this whole period. And from this point of view, it is a happy end. philosophy, new outlook, new attitude towards any organization of sounds. It's a totally open, unprejudiced view of any piece of music where anything is possible. No conventions, no limitations. It is the music where any alien experience is welcome, where all influences are encouraged. The only thing that is taboo is cliches. This is the music that questions, but doesn't give any answers. It is inclusive and not exclusive. It celebrates diversity while remaining true to itself. Since a great part of this music is improvised, the author and the performer merge into one personality. That is why the personality of the performer becomes so important. New music has emerged out of a protest, however, a protest of a special kind. It is neither political nor social. It is spiritual. It is a protest against hypocrisy and consumerism, against banality and conformity. No wonder that new music found such favorable soil in the Soviet Union although it came there from the West 
with some delay. The most controversial artist of new music in Russia of the 80s was Sergei Kuryokhin. 